Hello everyone and welcome to Farm Bureau's Voices of Agriculture. This week, coming to you from the state of Mississippi. On the show this time, we visit a man that's harvesting and selling pine straw. We meet a former CEO who's now farming in a unique way. We see a trailer that's telling the story of agriculture around the country. We also go to Los Angeles, California to see what farmers are telling urban folks about agriculture. And finally, our Mississippi on the Menu segment with home economist Nancy Freeman. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Mississippi Family Farms sustain a long, proud tradition that has been handed down for generations. A safe, dependable source for food, fiber, and timber, Mississippi Family Farmers help feed your family as well as their own. Through best practices and modernization, Mississippi farmers continue to be good stewards of our land and water resources, ensuring a reliable, affordable source of food well into the future. The Farm Families of Mississippi. The sound of these bees is the sound of a safe environment and of an important source of safe, affordable food. Honey is a specialty crop produced in our state that is created from plants in our area. Mississippi beekeepers provide a safe, abundant, and affordable supply of honey to homes and restaurants statewide, while byproducts are used in soaps and other skin care products. Support Mississippi beekeepers. Buy locally produced honey. The Farm Families of Mississippi. Traditionally, a landowner with a stand of pine trees would see income from that timber only at the time of thinning or at final harvest. But some Mississippi tree farmers are getting an income from their trees every year by harvesting and selling the pine straw. Lee Hazlitt is an innovative guy that has found a way to create an income by providing a product that is in much demand, pine straw. We've been in business about six years, uh, baling pine straw in North Mississippi. We're the only pine straw baler in North Mississippi. Uh, the box, we are baling pine straw using a standard box baler, which is made out of wood. Hazlitt harvests the pine straw from about 600 acres in six different locations in Panola County. Last year, he baled about 70,000 bales of straw, all of it done by hand. Basically, we use a box baler made out of wood which is the traditional way of doing it. And uh, the ground is so uneven, they can roll it through the woods and roll it over the hills and dales as they go. We have 16 of these box balers. It cost about $400 to build one of them. The workers are independent contractors that set their own hours and get paid by the bale for what they produce. They come to work when they want to. They leave when they want to. If they have to leave in the middle of the day, they're allowed to do that. The only thing I need them to do is produce enough straw at the times that I need it. Right now we're producing about six to 700 bales a day and we immediately sell it. In a day's time they can bale uh, usually between 80 to 150 bales a day depending upon how much they stay at it and how long they work. But in a, in a general 10 hour day they'll do 100 to 120 bales. Hazlitt says that about a million bales of pine straw are being imported each year for use in central and north Mississippi. Most of that is brought in on 18 wheelers from Alabama, Georgia, and Florida. The largest single user in North Mississippi is the University of Mississippi in Oxford, which uses about 100,000 bales a year. Hazlitt supplies about 4,000 of those. From an income standpoint, Hazlitt says a landowner would benefit greatly by harvesting and selling the pine straw. Farmers would think that they would normally grow in the trees, they would grow them to the 10 or 12 year point, they would harvest them to make some revenue in thinning process, and then at the 25 to 35 point, year point, they would take the trees and, and harvest them for, uh, for saw timber. Uh, in reality, you can make more money by baling pine straw off your land from the eight year point up to the 35 and beyond point, and have a revenue stream of about uh, probably $300 per acre per year because it keeps reproducing. And it generally doesn't require much work to go in and, and continue receiving that same revenue. An acre of pine trees will generate about 150 to 200 bales of pine straw a year. A pine straw bale is about two feet long, about 15 inches square. So it only weighs about 15 to 18 pounds. On the wholesale market, you can generally sell it for 250 to 350 a bale. At the retail level, at some of the stores you'll find it, anywhere from $4.50 a bale up as high as $8 a bale. 
Hazlitt says that you don't want to remove all the straw from a stand because the straw provides nutrients to the trees. But there are benefits to getting most of the straw off the land other than income. You remove the fire hazard because if you do have a fire come through, then you remove the fuel that the fire would feed on in the woods. So many uh, tree farmers will go through and burn their land and burn it thoroughly just to remove the, the underbrush. Uh, you probably read about it in the news recently some controlled burns out in Colorado that got out of hand and actually burned a lot of houses down. So harvesting the pine straw reduces the hazard and removes the need for doing controlled burns in the forest. Pine trees drop their needles in October and November, but it's best to harvest the straw only when you need it. It starts deteriorating when you take it out of the woods. You'll notice the, uh, the way we have the straw stacked over here in the fact that we don't take it out of the woods and put it on the trailers even until we're ready to sell it and deliver it to the customer. So even if we have a lot of extra straw available, we leave it underneath the trees until we're ready to sell it. Uh, right now, this is the busiest period of the year, which is March, April, and May. We'll sell approximately 50% of what we sell during the year during these three months. If I had 6,000 bales of straw right now, I could deliver it tomorrow. How great would it be if you could bring home farm fresh produce almost any month of the year? Well, through an emerging technology called a high tunnel system, it's now possible for Mississippi farmers to extend the growing season for a variety of fruits, vegetables, and even cut flowers. Unlike a traditional greenhouse, the high tunnel is a simple, unheated structure that requires lower startup and input costs, and it allows a farmer to produce great tasting produce virtually year round. Cindy Ayers has a farm located about two miles from downtown Jackson. Welcome to Footprints Farm. You're right here in the mid of the city of Jackson in Hines County. Urban farming, rural farming, it is best right here. Welcome to Footprints Farm. Ayers constructed this high tunnel with the help of funding through the EQIP program from the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So this way would allow us to actually grow almost 12 months a year. And that means rotating your crops, being able to go in to plant them, to harvest them, and then go back and replant again. The tunnel is designed to protect plants from rain and wind and to smooth out the fluctuating temperatures of the late fall and early spring. This technology actually dates back to China. They called them solar greenhouses. These solar greenhouses were really cool. And in February, at our latitude in China, they were harvesting watermelons out of high tunnels. And this was back in the... In, uh, the early 2000s, but they had been doing it for decades in China. And it turns out they have hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of hectares or acres of high tunnels end to end. A high tunnel is basically an unheated greenhouse. But unlike a greenhouse, there's really no heating system. The only utility in most high tunnels is water that's required. You have to have water because you have a roof. Some high tunnels now will have electricity uh, for running fans or for running irrigation cycling equipment and things like that. But there's almost never a permanent heating structure in there. And unlike a greenhouse, it's designed to be passively ventilated. The sides open up, the doors open up on the ends, so all four sides open up to get a cross ventilation through. You can lower the sides to keep the tunnel warm in the wintertime, open it to get cross ventilation, cool it in the summertime. Out in the traditional fields, of course, you got weather, rain, and other natural things that will keep you from being able to grow. This is more a controlled structure. We actually can look at how our watering is done, what we, do, we look at how we make this more efficient um, because we can control it more. Traditionally, the sun that's, that's coming into this structure gives you more energy that's coming from the rays, natural sunlight to make things grow. And of course, with that, you get a better product. Um, the products is, 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 will produce more which gives you more volume, again, for consumption, for self, as well as for market. Evans says these tunnels, if managed properly, can gross about $10,000 per tunnel if you harvest three to four times a year. That's for produce. But another option for farmers is cut flowers. Down at Truck Crops, I have a colleague, Gui Hong Bi, and she's my counterpart on this grant at my station. And she's been growing zinnias in the high tunnels. She has cut out of half a high tunnel, 30 by 96, ours are 30 by 96, she has cut in one season 10,000 zinnias. If you think about that, if you could get 50 cents a stem for those zinnias, that's $5,000. And that's in half a tunnel, and that's in uh, less than half a year of production. 
Ayers is a first-generation farmer who made the conscious decision to get into agriculture at a time when many people are getting out. I never thought I would be farming. I never thought I'd be an ag producer, but life and different things and understanding makes things better. I've traveled the world. I wore a lot of high heels. Now, no longer high heels, now work boots. Because I do understand the importance of what we have to do to truly be good stewards, to be good stewards to this earth, to take care of this. We can be great producers and we can make some money and we can make an impact and we can make a difference and we can still take care of our earth all at the same time. So let's be earth friendly. Let's look at our, our impact of our nature. Let's look at our trees and look at, look at our water because we have to look at what's gonna be here for my grandchildren. What are we going to have? What are we going to lead them? And this earth is all we have. We have one time to get it right. And we're doing so many things that's wrong. So by being an ag producer, by being a farmer, I feel like that I'm giving back to some of the greatness that's been given to me. Buying locally grown food is very important to many folks in today's society. Being able to provide that locally grown product from a trusted source is a bonus. This food is grown healthy. I know where it comes from, know your farmer. I want you to know me. I want you to know these hands and working with other people make this possible. So it's not coming in from outside the country. It's being grown right here. And it's being grown on Mississippi soil right here in Mississippi. And I'm so very proud of it. I'm so proud to be a Mississippian. We'll be right back after these messages. Farming has been my family's business for eight generations. I'm proud to be one of the Mississippi farmers who provides food to families that is safe, reliable, and affordable. In some countries, families spend up to half their income on food, while here in America, we spend about 10%, just 10%. Support Mississippi farmers. Buy Mississippi-grown products and food. It's good for your family. It's good for Mississippi. The Farm Families of Mississippi. Educating the public about what goes on in agriculture and how it affects them is a big challenge. One effort that's paying off very well is the America's Farmers Mobile Experience, sponsored by Monsanto. We're very fortunate in this country to have an abundant supply of affordable, healthy food. And sometimes people take that for granted. In less than 40 years, there will be over 9 billion people on the planet. All of these people will need food. All of these people will need clothes. America's Farmers Mobile Experience allows people to hear the story of agriculture from an American farmer. We want to give people, just take 25 minutes or so, step into um, the life of an American farm family, hear from a farmer's perspective what they're doing, hear about the tools and technologies that are involved with farming, and um, you know, just spend a little time hearing, hearing that story from the farmer's perspective. This 53-foot trailer unfolds to reveal agriculture in an interactive, hands-on experience that many non-farm people have never seen. We hear a whole variety of comments from, hey, I didn't have any idea that all of this went into farming, that farming is such a, a scientific business. I didn't realize that most farms were family owned. We've even had people say, we had one guest comment that they didn't realize that the kernels from corn, that when we held up a, a cob of corn, of field corn, that that was actually, that's where those all started out because they had seen, you know, corn, individual kernels, I guess probably from a can. It takes about 25 minutes to work your way through the multi-million dollar exhibit. It's divided into three sections. The first section talks about the challenge that's ahead, and it's not just a challenge for farmers, it's the challenge for, of our planet of feeding nine billion people by 2050, and that we have to produce as much food in the next 50 years as has been produced in all of recorded time to this point. And just to kind of bring that point home with folks, there's a, a touch screen game that you can play in the first section, testing your knowledge. You know, how much water does it take to produce um, this much crop? Or how, you know, some of those kind of questions just to see how much you know. The second section is a 180 degree HD visual theater where visitors meet a real farm family talking about what farming means to them. I don't have words for what I do. It's a wonderful feeling. I consider it a lifestyle, I guess. My past, my future, everything rolled into one. We're living our dream. 
And then finally, in the last section, you hear a little bit more about the tools and technologies that are important to farming, to meeting the demands of a planet with 9 billion people. Our seed chipper technology is a technology that Monsanto developed. It allows us to take a very small shaving of the seed to analyze the DNA of that uh, kernel of corn. We actually chip uh, several different seeds, but by doing that, they can be scientifically analyzed and then we can make the decision about whether or not that should move on in the process versus actually having to plant that seed, grow it, and then determine yes or no that was good or bad. So it has really improved the, the timing of that and allows us to do that a lot more, a lot more quickly. And as we have guests taking the tour, we allow them to, uh, to chip a piece of corn so that they can see how that works. The first event was in March of 2011, and they've been on the road virtually nonstop since then. To find out when the exhibit will be near you, visit americasfarmers.com and click on the Events Near You tab. More people than ever before are interested in learning more about where their food comes from and how it gets from farm to plate. This presents a terrific opportunity for farmers and ranchers. We have something to say about a topic that many people care about. The conversation about food production is well underway, and as producers of food, farmers and ranchers have a story to tell that won't otherwise be told if we don't join the conversation. One event that helps with the dialogue was held in Los Angeles, California. Food, it's a topic we're all passionate about, and more than ever, people are asking, where does it come from? I think it's exciting that more people want to know about where it came from, how it was grown, who's growing it. That's a very positive thing. The Food Dialogues was a two-day, four-panel event held in Los Angeles where industry experts, farmers, ranchers, and consumers discussed questions around how food is grown and raised. The focus? Farming and ranching is a dynamic and innovative industry that continues to do things better. We spoke with industry experts and panelists to get their take. One of the unique things we do is take the technology of ultrasound and scan our animals every week so we know how fast they grow. Turkey farming in general has just been really dynamic over the last decade. We're able to offset our high demand electrical usage by creating our own solar power to uh, create our own green energy and stay off the grid. Well, there's a lot of really exciting things going on. Farmers are using a lot of technology to very precisely manage their inputs, which is very good for the environment, using water much more efficiently. We switch to a drip irrigation system. We use less water. We only irrigate where the vines are. You know, a field is our store, just like a business owner has a storefront. The field is our storefront, and so we need to take care of that field. It's those types of things that are continuing to evolve and those type of technologies that continue to be introduced that really make me excited. Using those new innovations and then and pushing the bar and, and continuously innovating is something that's really exciting. It's clear there is an overwhelming excitement about the future of farming and ranching. I am excited that from um, a farming background and a farmer myself and a person who loves to cook that we have the opportunity to come um, to a city like Los Angeles and talk about food and farming and the important key issues that we see on the farm and the issues that are faced to the chefs who are preparing the food and the people who are eating the food. I'm involved in the university and involved in research and I just think that the, uh, the future of agriculture, the future of food is pretty bright. Uh, the University of California, we have record, uh, record enrollments in all of our colleges of agriculture uh, and in the related biological sciences. So yeah, uh, it's a very exciting uh, place to be. And, and also we're seeing lots of research dollars being made available to the faculty and so forth. They're kind of young environmentalists as well. Uh, they think about uh, the land quality, the air quality, the water quality. That's the first things they think about in the spring. We all want to leave the land better than when we got it. and. You're seeing lots of things with water quality and manure recycling and composting and um, using the resources that we produce on our farm instead of it, um, using them as waste and we can't use these, we're incorporating those back into the farm to make what we do more sustainable and more environmentally friendly and I think environmentally friendly is something that we as farmers, um, it's a top priority for us to make sure that what we are doing is great for the land. It's an invitation for us to have a conversation about where our food comes from, how it was grown and who who 
produced it, and I love the opportunity it presents for all of us. For an extended look and to join the conversation, visit fooddialogues.com. Stay tuned for our Mississippi on the Menu feature right after these messages. I'll never forget the pride that my dad took in the crops that he grew on our farm. He always said the work we do is important, that we feed Mississippi and the country. We can help people put healthy, safe, and affordable food on their table, and that's a reason to be proud. Americans spend only about 10% of their disposable income on food. In some countries, it's 50%. Mississippi farmers are proud to do our part to help families enjoy safe, healthy food at affordable prices. The Farm Families of Mississippi. Hey everybody, the chicks are here. Baby chicks are one day old when they come to the farm. The houses are clean, stocked with plenty of fresh food and water, and just the right temperature. Our birds are kept inside to protect them and prevent diseases. We work hard to make sure that these chicks grow up healthy. Healthy animals ensure a healthy food source for your family. We're proud to be Mississippi farmers, feeding Mississippi and the world. The Farm Families of Mississippi. For years, Mississippi families have been enjoying farm-raised catfish. But you know, in our recent years, we have to be careful with our farm catfish because there's been some inferiors that have invaded our market. So be sure when you're looking for catfish in your local market to look for the catfish, U.S. catfish symbol on it. So you'll know you're buying farm-raised catfish some of it grown right here in Mississippi. You know, Mississippi is very happy with our catfish farming because it provides $222 million worth of economic value to our state. So by all means, have some Mississippi catfish. Besides, it's a delicious value for your families. High in protein, low in calories, and is versatile. Now, most of us grew up in the South eating tuna salad sandwiches. Why not have catfish salad? It's great. I have took a catfish filet and all you have to do is take it and put it in some water with some lemon juice and then I take it and I braised it in there and post it in there for about seven minutes. That's all it takes. And then you're just going to take it, break it up just like you see me doing right here with a fork. Very easy and simple to do. And this is going to be our base for starting with our catfish salad. To this, we're going to add all the typical makings that you would think of if you were making a meat salad. We're going to put our catfish in. Delicious, light, smells great. We're going to add some hard cooked eggs in there that we've got. I like to add a little ripe olives to mine. And again, this can be something you adjust as you want. Dill pickle, because I like that tartness against it. A little bit of chopped celery and some chopped pimentos. This is going to be our base to our particular product. And to this we're going to add a really neat little sauce. Uh, I've got some lemon juice. I'm going to add a little bit of mayo. And if you're trying to cut calories a little bit, add a little light mayo or the fat free. Any of it works just as well that you can use. I'm going to add a little salt and pepper. And here's the kicker. How about some delicious horseradish that we're going to put in there. And even if you're not a big fan of horseradish, I promise you, you'll like it in this dish because it adds that little bit of zip to it that we're going to have. You just simply put this all together, stir it up, and put it in the fridge and chill it until you're ready to enjoy. It makes delicious sandwiches and so forth that you can have in it, just stirring it up. I have some already made right here, and you can see it is really tasty. It's pretty, beautiful color. Take a nice tomato. Who wouldn't want a delicious salad like that for lunch one day or for a quick evening dinner when you come in from work? Make some great sandwiches, take to a picnic that you've got, or a family gathering. Join us at Farm Families of Mississippi at our website, growingmississippi.org, to find out some more information about farm families and how they contribute to our state. And that's all the time we have for this edition of Voices of Agriculture. We hope you've enjoyed the show and will be with us again next time. For all of us here at the Mississippi Farm Bureau, thanks for watching.